Hello, everybody. It's uh, my absolute pleasure to bring to you from Link Online a webinar which has been sponsored by MIVI Neuroscience. Our hope is to be able to discuss with you overcoming distal, distal stroke challenges in flow, clot dislodgement during large vessel occlusion, thrombectomy, and ingestion with next generation catheters. Uh, we hope this will be about 60 minutes. And our hope is that um, this uh, webinar will allow you to explore challenges in distal stroke navigation, flow, impulse, clot dislodgement, clot ingestion, and real clinical insights into um, the upcoming uh, live and interactive webinar. We hope you'll be able to learn um, understanding Q catheter's unique design and its distinction in distal stroke interventions, explore the scientific principles and aspiration performance, learn procedural best practices for effective use in clinical settings, compare um, the Q catheter with traditional catheters, and examine some real life case studies to evaluate safety and efficacy. I'm absolutely delighted to present to you an excellent faculty uh, led first by Paolo Maki, who is uh, the chair of interventional neuroradiology at Geneva University Hospital and um, um, a, the leader of uh, ESMINT in terms of uh, running the meetings and uh, upcoming uh, presidency. Then we have James Warham, who's an interventional neuroradiologist from North Bristol NHS Trust uh, in UK. Um, and finally, we have Tobias Bock Behrens, who is head of interventional radiology at Clinic uh, Rex de Isar der in Munich. Um, and uh, with that, I'm absolutely delighted to invite Paolo uh, to uh, move on with his talk. And uh, again, we really want people to throw in as many questions as possible. I have some prepared anyways, uh, but uh, we'll go over them as we move along. So Paolo, all yours. Thank you, Adnan. First of all, it's a pleasure and honor to be here today as a faculty member with this um, colleagues and friends, and uh, I hope that I will give my support and uh, um, experience with this uh, new the device, the technology device. I would like to have my presentation, please, if possible. So what we did was um, uh, conduct testing to evaluate the behavior and we compared with traditional catheters, as you said. The idea was to understand which is the, which are the physical principle related to this new catheter. So I just showed my disclosure. This is, uh, of course, a sponsored um, uh, symposium, but it's the results, what I'm going to present are the results or experiments that we conduct particularly in my lab, also in the lab from maybe, and the experiments were focused on evaluating specific features, which are the parameters of the thromboaspiration. Thromboaspiration principle are basically the flow rate, which is the amount of fluid um, aspirated by the catheter in a specific uh, amount of time. The impulse, I will try to explain a little bit later, is the velocity to get uh, to a certain level of flow rate. Then we evaluate the uncorking force, also named aspiration force, is the force needed to detach a clot which is stuck at the distal tip of the catheter for example, when in the course of the procedure, you have the clot, typically a stiff clot, aspirated the distal tip, and then you want to uh, secure the clot, you want to ask, retrieve the clot with the catheter. So by evaluating such force, you evaluate the rate that you have to retrieve the clot out from the patient body after um, aspiration. Then we have clot ingestion. Ingestion is actually the um, the phenomena where the clot, typically a soft clot, is completely ingested by the 
the catheter. So basically, clot ingestion is uh, the phenomena um, when the clot is uh, soft, while aspiration force is more the, the principle related to the capture when the clot is, st is stiff and remains stuck at the distal tip of the clot. To do this, we use a different type of clots, synthetic clots, soft and intermediate clots. And also we compare with uh, other leaders, I mean, bench uh, marks, uh, catheters benchmark in the market, like three um, French, four French, and five French catheters. So the next uh, uh, slide is... Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the system is not really working. I tried to move forward. Please, assistance, if you can. Yeah, thanks. So this is actually a slide is showing the, let's say, the rationale behind or the secret of these catheters. This is given by the shape. The Q catheters are basically extension catheters. So they are made of a wire, of a delivery system that is used to push the catheter itself inside another catheter. And so the lumen of the catheter is then added to the lumen of the guide catheter. And so there is a transition in between the lumen of the distal portion of, of the catheter, which is the Q catheter itself, and the proximal lumen, which is the lumen of the guide catheter. You can image a conic lumen and a catheter with a conic lumen. And this is the main difference as compared to standard catheter, where the lumen of the catheter remains the same for the entire length of the, of the device. And so we would see that this has an impact on the um, principle related to the aspiration. Next slide, please. So this is the... Uh, flow rate quantification, we evaluated the water basically aspirated in, uh, in a certain amount of time. And because this conic, if you want, lumen of the ensemble of the Q catheter plus the guide catheter, you see that there is a huge difference as compared to a three French or four French or five French catheter, uh, traditional catheters. And this due again to the specific uh, design. Next slide, please. Again, this is just to show where there is a, this difference. If you look at the arrows, you see then in the Q catheter um, technology, the arrows are increasing in, in the size, which is not the same for standard catheter where it always all have the same lumen. Next slide. So this is just uh, to explain the principle, but that just to make a long short story, uh, a long short story short, sorry, the, the radius and the length of the catheter are the related to the fundamental of the aspiration flow. And so by increasing the, the radius, you increase basically the, um, the parameters. And this is what happened with the Q technology. And so, you have the very high peak of the aspiration, so the, the flow rate in a very short period of time. And this is the second, let's say, secret of the system. What is named the impulse. It's basically the velocity that you need to get to certain flow rate. And this is also related to the, um, this is the velocity. So very uh, quickly you get to the higher uh, flow rate possible, especially in the very first second, as compared to competitors' catheters. And this is what you can easily see in this video. Basically, what happens is that the Q4 is able to ingesting quickly and faster as compared to the other catheter, the, the clot, which is basically the same. This is because, given the scanic lumen of the device made of the Q catheter plus the guide catheter, then you have an, a faster process uh, linking to this uh, acceleration, which is named the impulse, which is the acceleration of the aspiration. Just to resume, I want to show you this uh, slide where you see that once you hit strongly the, the ball, the golf ball, then you have deformation, and this is given then 
an increase in the reaction and the uh, velocity of, of the ball. This is exactly what happens with this famous impulse. And this is the ingestion. This is a different catheters, the surface are different clots, but you see that for the same principle, you have a very fast and faster ingestion of the clot as compared with the four uh, French catheter. And here you see actually just a slide reporting the time of the ingestion. And you see that Q catheters technology, the three, the four, the five, have a better behavior and faster ingestion of the other uh, as compared to the um, competitor uh, device. This is the clot dislodgement force for the same principle. You have uh, in this video, what, ha what we do is that we go, this is made in my lab, so we go to aspirate the membrane, and then we have a traction a tensile machine, traction machine, which detaches basically the catheter from the membrane, and we measure the force needed to detach the catheter, to detach the catheter. This is simulating the force needed to detach as um, a clot. And what happens here is because this conic shape, because this impulse, because this velocity in getting the higher um, flow rate, then you have higher ingestion of the of the membrane and so higher force needed to detach the clot or uncorking force. So in conclusion, as compared to other devices, we have that we have a higher flow rate, higher velocity in getting the higher flow rate. So what we name impulse. So impulse lead to a better clot ingestion for soft clot, then clot ingestion or impulse lead to a better clot ingestion, while for hard clot leads to higher uncorking force or aspirating force. This is, of course, just uh, an in vitro experience, so we don't have clinical results to report in this um, slide, and we don't have also uh, trackability testing that we already uh, performed, but we done report in the slides because they are more related to the clinical experience. And so I'm happy now to uh, hear from you guys the clinical result of this uh, technology that my to my heart is extremely uh, promising. Thank you and happy to, to hear from you now. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you very much. Um, uh, does the panel have any questions for Paolo? I certainly have a couple but uh, I'll let you guys go first, Jim or Tobias. Um, so you talked about a lot of different things, uh, Paolo. And uh, generally speaking, when we talk to people who are using aspiration as a first-line therapy, um, they just say it, really the only factor is vacuum is constant force. And so the only thing you can vary is cross-sectional area of the device that is applying that constant force. Um, and it's not really uh, a determination between the, the, the attributes of the tube that covers, that connects the cross-sectional interaction area with the vacuum source. Um, what you just presented strongly argues against that. Mm -hmm. um, so what aspect of this is, you know, how, how do you address those concerns? Yeah. So thank you, Andan. Of course, it's a very, very clever question. <laughs> so as ever, uh, coming from you. So it's right. When you we talk about aspiration force, meaning the force um, needed to detach a clot or the force needed to keep a clot, stuck the distal surface of the, the aspiration catheter, we know that this force is related to the surface, so basically to the radius of the, of the catheter. But in this case, because this, let's say, not constant radius, but this increasing radius, once the vacuum system is starting on, what happens is that you get some flow rate, which is, will be the same for another catheter, having the same radius, the same surface of the distal tip. But what happens is that this 
flow rate and specifically the highest level of flow rate is obtained faster. This is what is named the inputs. And this is uh, not new, it's a, 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 a physical uh, concept. And what happens with this impulse is that a, a clot that could be, of course, soft, but especially a, a, a stiff clot is aspirated better or more, if you want, as compared to uh, another catheter. And so this really principle is really related to the velocity that you have to get to the same flow rate. And so this impulse is the secret behind this higher radial force, but um, for the same, let's say, uh, French size uh, as compared to another device. So the secret is the connection with the guide catheter, making this um, catheter, the ensemble of the catheter, having an increasing diameter, an increasing inner lumen. Um, well, you convinced me. Now, let me ask you one other um, question. And that is specifically talking about the uncorking force. So yeah. your test method is your tip is stuck to a membrane and you're measuring the force required to dislodge the tip. Um, now, shouldn't that be just cross-sectional area? How do you see a difference there? Because that's not really that first, second impulse. Yeah, good question. So what do you see actually? You see that the membrane is basically, you can take a four French Q catheter, four French, um, let's say, competitor catheter, and you look at the membrane. So when the, the watching system is turning it on, then the 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 portion of the membrane, which is ingested, let's say, by the catheter, is longer in the Q catheter because such impulse. And that's where you see, actually, uh, and you watch this difference within within uh, the Q catheter and the uh, competitor. And then it's also explained why, when you want to detach this membrane or the catheter, you have higher force needed because the surface of the membrane is higher inside the Q catheter. Well, so before we go to uh, James and Tobias next in terms of clinical practice, um, what do you think are the, the most, um, you know, uh, attrib most relevant attributes that you think we might see in clinical practice with this modified approach to aspiration? Uh, is there something, I, how do you feel that this will work compared to other standard therapies? Stent retrievers, aspiration catheters with solid lumens. Uh, it's a question to me? Yes. So, I yeah. mean, what do you predict? I'm just wondering, so based on your experimental studies, do you think this is a, a clear differentiator for distal occlusions, um, or uh, this uh, you think there's theoretical benefit, but you need to see clinical data? I mean, I'm just wondering how optimistic you are about yeah. this being um, yeah. uh, trans transformational in the distal and mevo space. Yeah, this is the interesting part because we're all wondering if you really have to go to treat distal occlusions. It seems that we have to, to treat, in some cases, we already treat, for example, um, for aphasia or um, related uh, symptoms. So the, mm, the rationale would be that with the thin catheter, you are going to aspirate in distal arteries. And of course, having higher uh, flow rate, higher aspiration for by itself seems to be a good thing. But then, of course, uh, has to be integrated in the, our techniques, in our all approaches, and probably is not going to change, let's say, the entire structure treatment, but it's going to be an additional tool. And in certain cases, could just by itself allow um, a, a prompt recanalization. Then, of course, it's, uh, it's a bit more complex. I think my vision 
from back to me is not just a device, it's a comprehension, it's clot location, it's a angle in between the artery where we are with the aspiration catheter or the stand trigger and the clot and so on and so on. But still having this knowledge and evaluating new devices, new technology, which is new for neuro because cardiologists already, they have similar devices, not intended to aspirate, but it's just intended to extend the guide catheter. But it makes sense. I think bring something new in our field and we need, we need to investigate. But again, I, I don't know if it's going to change um, completely the clinical practice, but I'm confident that it's a very useful and clever tool for our um, fight against the stroke. Well, great. Thank you, Paolo. I think now we're going to find out as to how much what you just predicted really bears, uh, bears truth or bears fruit. That's why I, I put you on the spot there, Paolo, because our next speaker, James uh, Wareham, is going to talk about adopting uh, the MIVI catheters um, in clinical practice, what he feels about his particular utility for MIVOs, and then also he has some uh, multi-center data that he can share with us on uh, clinical performance. So, uh, and then maybe towards the end, we'll do a whole bunch of polling questions all in one time at the end of the webinar. Um, but go ahead, James. Thank you very much for joining. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, excellent. So um, I've been uh, uh, using the Q system for the last couple of years. Um, for my um, stroke thrombectomy cases. Uh, and I've done well over 100 cases with the Q catheter system, not just uh, Mevos, but I also use it for um, LVO as well. So I just want to share a little bit about um, why I use it and then um, also share some of my own results and the results from a multi-center study um, that um, we've uh, uh, published. So why do I use it? Um, three main reasons, really. Uh, firstly, it's easier to use as a single operator. Uh, the, the, the system tracks and navigates really well, uh, and it achieves good results. So why is it easier to use as a single operator? Well, the unique design of the Q system is, uh, means that your aspiration pump and, or your aspiration source is attached directly to your guide catheter. So when you're aspirating at the, at the clot, you attach the aspiration pump to your guide catheter and that uh, translates the aspiration force through the guide catheter and then through the Q catheter, which as we've previously heard, acts to extend, it's sort of like an extension limb of the guide catheter. And because you've got that continual aspiration force um, through the guide catheter into the Q catheter, you don't need to worry about having an additional VACLOC syringe on the guide catheter when you're performing the procedure. And for the same sort of reason, um, you only need to have two flush systems as well. So when you're um, uh, prepping just before the case, your flush for the um, guide catheter also acts as the flush system for your Q catheter. So uh, it, that also speeds up um, the, certainly in our um, centre trying to, uh, we're not allowed to prep the bags before the, the patient's uh, asleep and draped. Um, so it just improves the speed and efficiency of the case. So um, the um, other reason that I use it is that it navigates really well. And so the Q3 um, and 4 catheters navigate incredibly well for distal occlusions. So this is a young patient that was treated um, for an M1 occlusion. And in the process of um, doing a pass for that, there was an embolus that went off um, down the ACA. Um, and you can see that it's quite distant location. And so um, because it was a, a young patient and some eloquent uh, brain, um, we targeted that uh, with a Q3 catheter uh, that navigated over a headway GA. And it, the, the catheters track and navigate around tortuous anatomy really, really nicely. Um, and that came out with one pass. And then finally, um, the reason that I use them is that they achieve really good results. So this is um, some of the uh, data that I've pulled um, so over uh, the course of a two-year period, 
uh, collected, prospectively collected data on 64 uh, medium and distal vessel occlusions that occurred in 51 patients. The median age of them was 64 uh, and a half years old uh, and 62 and a half percent were male with a median NIHSS score of 17. 42% of these were primary um, occlusions and 58% were secondary occlusions. And you can see that the two cohorts of primary and secondary occlusions were relatively well matched for background comorbidities, including diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, AFib, and um, previous stroke. 25% of these were in the ACA territory, 67% uh, in the MCA territory, and a far smaller proportion in the posterior circulation. So my uh, if preferred uh, Q catheter choice is I you try to use the Q4 if I can. It's uh, it's larger, um, so that's why the, the vast majority of my my cases were, were were for Q4s. But obviously you're limited by vessel size, so I also used a fair few Q3s in that um, series of patients. Um, the Q5 only used um, in, a, in a very small number just because of the size of the vessel that you're trying to uh, track into. And my overall rates of recanalization were um, just over 76% overall, 81% in the secondary um, occlusions and 70% in the primary MEVO group. And the overall uh, modified tiki 2 b 3 first pass effect was 61%. The, um, the safety of the device is also really good. So there were um, uh, three reperfusion hemorrhages into the basal ganglia in patients who had a LVO and had sort of re that sort of typical reperfusion hemorrhage that you, you see. And then uh, there were um, three, um, three patients that had some non-symptomatic uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and just one patient that had uh, some hemorrhagic transformation, which was symptomatic. Um, so overall, very safe uh, and very trackable and achieves very good results. So there is also a multi-centre uh, study that um, we published that combined the data of two centres in the UK uh, and two centres in the US. Uh, this group had 69 occlusions in total uh, with a median age of 71 years 52% uh, being male and a median NIHSS score of 14. 48% of these were primary um, occlusions and 52% of them, 52 of them were secondary occlusions. And once again, there was no real uh, statistical difference in the background comorbidities, although you can see that um, AFib was slightly higher in the primary group than in the secondary group. 13% of these were in the anterior, circular, uh, anterior cerebral artery territory, 83% were in the MCA territory, and once again, similar to my cohort, a very much smaller percentage were in the posterior circulation. Q catheter usage in this cohort was more, um, uh, sort of more highly uh, towards the Q3 catheter, uh, but then again, a, a large number of Q4s being used uh, with the larger Q5 and Q6 or 5 and 6 French systems being used in, in, a, in a much um, sort of my, more of the minority of cases. And the rates of recanalization of this were really impressive. So um, overall, uh, the uh, Tiki 2B3 rate was 92.8% with a modified uh, first pass effect of uh, 70%. So 94.4% of secondary occlusions recanalized and 90.9% of um, primary occlusions. Symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage rate of 2.9% uh, and a 90 day MRS um, of zero to two of 50%. So a really um, impressive um, rate of successful recanalizations. And I think it's uh, useful when to compare that. So a recent um, uh, study published in um, European Stroke Journal in January of this year uh, did a meta-analysis uh, that included um, 12 cohort studies in an RCT that had um, 18, over 1,800 patients. 
And in the stent retriever uh, and aspiration arm, they had um, a TIKI 2B3 rate of 78% in the aspiration only group. Um, they had a TIKI 2B3 rate of 75%. So when you look at the um, encouraging data from the, the multi-center study, I think that um, the rates of recanalization achieved with the Q system are really impressive and um, are sort of like the real world Ex, sort of experience that um, you can see um, gained from what Paolo was uh, discussing earlier about the, the, the concept and the technology behind the improved um, impulse and um, rate of achieving peak uh, aspiration force. So in um, conclusion, uh, the uh, Q catheters are uh, safe and effective and the uh, the um, impressive benchtop data um, translates into real world practice. Thank you very much, James. Uh, wonderful talk and uh, really good to see uh, that Paolo's science is being is being manifested in clinical sort of reality. Um, let me ask you a couple of quick questions before we go to our last talk. Um, and that is prior to the availability of the Q system, what was your primary strategy for Mevo or Devo? Were you not treating them at all or what were you doing? And then in that context, what was it about Q that caused you to change your strategy to Q? Um, so yeah, I mean, prior prior to having uh, the Q system, um, I had tried um, with the three max for these distal occlusions. Um, I've always been sort of less inclined in very distal locations to start trawling um, stents too aggressively. So um, used to, used to use the three max, uh, and in my hands, I didn't have a huge amount of success in in retrieving large clots. Um, with it. Um, so so one, one quick sort of question. I want you to, you said something that piqued my interest. What is it about stent retrievers that causes you to be reluctant to use them in very distal locations? I just think it's uh, sometimes, it was, I, have, I mean, I have used stent retrievers in, in distal locations and it, I think it's sometimes the distortion of the anatomy when you've got an, a road map and then you see where the, the, the vessels are moving towards in those distal locations uh, starts making you feel a bit uneasy um, about, um, and um, you know, particularly when you're targeting uh, distal, uh, distal occlusions, it's weighing up risk and benefit and the patient as a whole, um, you know, and um, you, uh, yeah, I just would, I prefer using aspiration um, as, as my first go-to with these, with these, um, these uh, occlusions. Um, and so why did I move towards using uh, the Q system? So I had um, an MCA, a, a case with a, an MCA clot and I had an embolus to a new territory that went into an A12 junction. And there was a, a little stenosis, probably some ICAD actually, um, at the origin of the A1. Uh, and I couldn't track a, um, uh, a Sophia 5 um, to, the, to the clot just because I think that the Sophia was a larger diameter than the, the vessel. Um, and so we'd the Q, the Q catheters had been brought in a few weeks prior, so I thought I'd, I'd give it a go. Um, and the Q4 tracked around really nicely to it uh, and aspirated a pretty long, large clot out on, on a first go. Um, and actually, I suppose that's how I started using the Q system, as I was using it initially just for uh, medium and distal vessel occlusions. And then I realized from the success I was having with that, that the, the concept and the technology behind it was obviously very good and then migrated to, towards using it for my proximal LVOs as well. So I think I probably went backwards to what some might have thought would be the transition of getting used to it for large vessel occlusions and then starting to move towards using it distally. I, I, I certainly, my learning experience was, was the reverse. Mm. 
Well, fantastic. I think uh, those are very insightful points. And with that, we'll move to our uh, third speaker, uh, Tobias bach Behrens, and he is going to share uh, with, uh, with us uh, additional clinical data from a different geography uh, and different perspective and some case reviews um, uh, to follow that. And then once we're done with that, we've got some polling questions that we can bring up as well and a general discussion as we go along. So with that, Tobias, thank you very much for joining us and it's all yours. Well, thank you, Adnan, for the introduction and thank you that I'm also, uh, that I can sh uh, share our experience with the queue and um, the data that were shown by James um, are obviously quite larger and, and more um, uh, uh, um, are better than ours, but I think it also makes sense to show you our experience because uh, our cohort is a little bit more focused and because uh, similar to that, what James uh, said, we just started to use the the queue in distal locations. And uh, the reason why we did that is that our standard approach is using a balloon guiding catheter in all our um, uh, recanalization uh, procedures. And um, up to now, there is no um, compatibility uh, for the Q system. Um, I think it will come soon, but uh, as I know, as far as I know, at the moment, there is uh, no uh, uh, compatibility. And that is why we only use this a system in cases where we anticipate uh, that the the additional benefit of a balloon guider is maybe not that uh, that large, and this is only in the in the smaller uh, vasculature. So, um, just to give you a short overview. So we we retrospectively analyzed all patients uh, in this um, shown period of time. Uh, these are preliminary data. It is not already published, so please excuse if there is some uh, data not complete. Um, in this cohort, we further stratified then how many LVOs, MIVOs, and DVOs, and we used more or less this scheme here that is shown uh, for the... Um, um, the stratification. So... In fact, we said only Devo is M3, starting from M3. Um, and the, the Mevos, so the M2s that we treated, were mostly distal M2s. So it is more, so there are um, sometimes different uh, um, uh, definitions of that. So, and, and the next step, then we stratified in first and second line approach which is not the same as uh, primary and secondary occlusions um, because it's only, uh, it shows, did we use this system as our first line um, strategy or is it a rescue therapy strategy? So these are our second line. So sometimes if we couldn't get the clot out, then we switch to the queue and then um, we used it as a rescue device more or less. So we had um, 32 occlusions in 26 patients. So there were several patients that had uh, multiple occlusions. Um, these are kind of the, the kind of uh, lo um, occlusion locations that we treated. We only had one LVO because in the posterior circulation, we generally do not use the, the balloon guider. And a little bit more MIVOs than DIVOs. So I think the... The main occlusion location is the distal uh, M2 segment. And uh, in 22 cases, uh, we used it in first-line therapy, and in 10 cases uh, as a um, rescue approach. So regarding our results, so the, the technical success rate was quite high. Uh, I think 
Uh, so it was 81% uh, TK2B and 3. And if we stratified in the MIVO and DIVO success rate, so there was an even a little bit higher success rate in the DIVOs, which um, was a, not really um, anticipated by me. I thought that they were more uh, difficult. But um, our data, as far as they are already, uh, show this kind of distribution. And the, the first pass rate is not that high, as James told. Um, it is 44%, but it's still in the range somehow uh, of the published data until now. Um, regarding if we stratify into first line and second line, then um, as expected, we had a little bit more first line success rates, uh, 86%. And if we use it in these hard clubs where we already had several uh, tries, then uh, there was a success rate of 70%, which is, I think, still quite good. Uh, okay, so at the end, I will just show you um, three cases uh, just to illustrate a little bit the kind of occlusions that we usually treated in, in this uh, cohort. So this is the uh, distal M2 occlusion of the parietal branch uh, of the MCA. And um, so this is a not really very, very small occlusion, and it uh, was treated by an um, uh, sheer aspiration by the Q3, um, quite fast and, and complete. Um, so this is a quite straightforward case. And the next case shows uh, a little bit more difficult one. So this is, um, there are two occlusions. In fact, we only targeted for the frontal one because the patient had an aphasia. Maybe you see in the, in the posterior part, uh, in the parietal region, there's a, another uh, small region of uh, perfusion deficit, but, but this is really very, very, very distal. And so we went for the, the, the frontal one, and they are usually a little bit more challenging because of the, the elongation and the, uh, the curving of these vessels. And... Um, this was also the case, and in this case, and you see the, the curves of the um, vessels after the reopening, and but it was much harder, and we used, in fact, in this case, a, a combined approach uh, where we combined it with a um, catch mini device, and it took much more time uh, to uh, get a successful um, result. And the last case I would like to show to you is this one from the posterior circulation where you have two um, occlusions, uh, the P1, um, which is a little bit a, a bigger occlusion, and the, uh, the SCA, uh, so that we usually avoid taking uh, stent retrievers. So in the first step, we just went for the, the P1, and this was uh, very straightforward with the Q4 system, uh, just a simple aspiration, uh, quite quick. Um, and in a second step, then we tried to go for the SCA. And on the left side, you see the, the Q3 inside of the SCA. And it was possible just to, to navigate the catheter without the help of an additional stent retriever, uh, just with an additional uh, microcatheter to the clot, um, to the proximal face of the clot. And with the aspiration, it was uh, everything uh, recanalized. So this is just to illustrate the kind of um, uh, occlusions that we treated in this cohort. So... To conclude, uh, I think I, I just can say more or less the same than James. I think it is very promising, and it is also promising in these very small caliber um, and distal vessel occlusions. Um, we also think that uh, the trackability is very good, and so far we, all, we also have no real device-related um, adverse events, uh, no 
larger bleedings or perforations so far, but maybe we will see this is a these are hard to to treat um, locations with a maybe a little bit more a higher um, risk profile than the, the large vessel occlusions. And we, I would be very um, happy if we could use a, a balloon guider compatible version soon. Okay, thank you very much. That's from me. Well, thank you very much, Tabas. Again, fantastic um, addition to the session today. Uh, let me ask you a few questions before we go to the polling questions. Um, so when you are evaluating uh, these uh, devices, what do you think should be th the primary endpoint? Uh, are we looking for safety for distal locations? Are we looking for first pass effect? Uh, is there some kind of ticky score? Because the I mean, you're starting off with a ticky 2B at least when you're in by definition going for Amiibo. Um, so what do you think? How best to evaluate our effectiveness? Of, well, as you know, there are these ongoing studies um, for evaluating the the clinical benefit of uh, occlusion or recanalization in distal occlusions. And uh, these data that I showed are before we joined the um, the distal trial. So I, I totally agree. I think, of course, the the main reasons why we do it is the the clinical benefit. But I think if we choose, if we uh, in general choose to to treat these kind of lesions, because maybe there are um, um, there are clinical deficits that are very hard for the patients, even if the NHSS is not very um, very high, like in aphasia and these kind of things. If we um, decide to, to treat these, then I think we should go for a, um, a complete recanalization success. So this is the, I think, uh, the thing that we should uh, go for. Would you well, agree with that? Um, no, I, I, I agree with you. I think we do need a different way to assess our effectiveness. I think safety is easy. Um, you know, uh, hemorrhage is a very good marker, whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic. I think that can be categorized. Um, I think we need to get greater sensitivity with a modified Rankin score too as we start treating these lower NIH scores. Uh, for better understanding what the impact clinical benefit is. And I think we probably need a better revascularization uh, score uh, for these distal locations. But let me just uh, say one other thing. So here uh, in the US, we have all our balloon guides. It's amazing. It used to always be the case where Europeans always had everything and we had nothing. Now it's the other way around. Uh, we have balloon guides from essentially every single company and the vast majority of them minus two are compatible with MIVI. Um, and so it really, that is really the best of both worlds where you can use these through balloon guides because I think that flow arrest while you're dragging it back is really important. So let's just have a little bit of a discussion about um, uh, clinical cases. Um, the vast majority of distal in MIVOs appear to be encountered after you've opened up an LVO. The question is, why does that occur? What are we doing that's facilitating distal embolization? And Paolo, we, we'll, we'll go around and so everybody can get a chance. So Paolo, I'll go to you first. Why do we get distal embolization? So I personally think that we have two types of <clears throat> distal occlusions. We have distal occlusions given by distal embolization, as you just mentioned, and this is probably related to softer clot because it's a clot coming from a proximal clot which fragmented. And usually are also patients who received already a TPA. So there it seems, let's say, um, 
at least to me, it seems uh, um, a bit more difficult to to retrieve this type of clot because it was at the origin a bigger clot uh, which remained stuck proximally because it was big and and and, and hard. So this is different, to my, to my opinion, to a um, distal clot, which is primarily distal, because to be distal needs to be soft. And uh, what I see is that typically when you go to aspirate a soft clot, so the clot which was primarily distal, then you can aspirate. And this is because the clot is ingested by the catheter. While when the clot is secondarily distal, then you need to use a stand. At least this is my impression in the clinical practice. Now, do you, I mean, do we uh, really are the cause of distal embolization? I don't know. It's something that often it's not clearly visible on the admitting CT scan or emitting images, but it could be. Now, how to do to avoid? Probably the um, thromboaspiration as a frontline technique is a good measure to try at least to avoid this embolization. For sure, this is uh, less, let's say, prone to clot, clot fragmentation as compared to when we go with a stand with a microcatheter, sorry, and we want to navigate distal. So first attempt with the thromboaspiration by itself, a, a first measure to avoid um, fragmentation. Then I, yeah, again, I personally think that we should have to try to aspirate. We can try to aspirate distal. If it doesn't work, then it means that there's a stiff clot. So we need to use a stent trigger that is, could be compatible with uh, whatever aspiration catheter. And again, we need to reproduce a situation where the clot is aspirated. And to me, the situation is where the aspiration catheter is concentrical to the, to the clot. So we use the stent retriever to retrieve the the clot close to the distal tip of the catheter, reproducing a coaxial interaction. The coaxial interaction means that the aspiration force is completely transmitted to the clot, and there aspiration is affected. Then what I do in my practice is that I retrieve completely the stent trigger outside the catheter because I want to get the higher flow rate, the higher aspiration force, and this is when the aspiration catheter is empty. So this is what I usually do. Well, uh, fantastic response. Let me switch to you, James. And by the way, while we are answering these questions, I've been told that the polling questions were up. Can you put those back up so that the audience can address all the questions and you can run them while we're having a discussion? People can uh, uh, can respond to the to the polling questions. Unfortunately, I don't see them on my end. But if you can, please put them back up. That'll be great. So, James, uh, this brings up the possibility of uh, bringing a concept to thrombectomy, which currently does not exist, uh, at least certainly not in widespread use, which is distal embolic protection. Um, now, I know maybe is working towards that system a little bit, but do you think is that the answer to address these predominant distal emboli that we deal with? And how how do you how do you see that coming into play as we go through these new technological uh, advancements? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think distal protection is, a, is going to be a really interesting concept to see how it, how it performs um, in, in real world practice. Um, obviously, balloon guides help with flow arrest, but they don't you know, stop flow across the, uh, the ACOM and cross flow and things. So, um, you always, you know, potentially going to have still have flow, uh, anterograde flow that could fragment clots distally. Um, so I think these distal protection um, systems will be really interesting to see how they translate to um, uh, improvement in in patient outcomes. Um, and I certainly going back to what you were just saying just a minute ago, I wonder whether sometimes with soft clot and the use of stent retrievers, sometimes that sort of the stent retriever almost can cheese wire through soft clot and break it up and fragment it and sort of you can make your life tougher in that way and in, in that if you're not using a balloon guide catheter um, and you 
fragment the clot a bit with a with a stent retriever, then uh, that can be one of the sources for your for your um, distal emboli. Um, but yeah, no, these the, uh, the the distal protection will be will be very interesting to see how because we've all had, I'm sure, pa patients where you get a very good recanalization, but the the patients don't do as well as you would think from from the uh, imaging appearances, uh, and, and I'm sure that is down to like sort of microembolic distal trashing of the of the cortex. Um, so if we can stop that from happening, it can only be a good thing. Thanks, James. Uh, and Tobias, for the last word, um, what do you think is currently missing uh, for uh, further effective utilization uh, of aspiration technologies in distal circulation beds? What is it that we still don't have? Do we need smaller catheters? Do we need longer? What do we need? Myers, what, what will make your life easier, better? Uh, what challenges are you still dealing with when you're doing these cases? So balloon guide I got. We got that one. What else? Yeah. I think um, the main challenge is still if you have very curved anatomy and then it, it's always a trade-off between having the, the, as big as it gets catheter to the, to the clot and of course, even if the trackability is good from the queue, you still have the uh, the cases where it is not possible to to go to the clot, except you use some kind of a stent retriever as an anchor or something like that. And I think if the trackability could be improved even a little more, then I would be happy. Well, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very informative discussion on uh, on Mevos using the Q catheter technologies. Um, uh, Mivi is working on a distal embolic protection device called Daisy. It's into first in man, and uh, I think uh, we all are excited about the possibility of using that because. I think that may help us reduce uh, distal embolic burden disease and uh, maybe an interesting innovation in this uh, thrombectomy space. Um, I thank you very much, Paolo, James, and Tobias for joining us today. And uh, the, 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 the webinar is going to be available on link online. Uh, give them a few days to get this curated, but they'll be able to present this in its entirety uh, in a few days. Um, any final comments? We have a couple of minutes, Paolo, James, Tobias, leave it up to you. No, I look forward to see how this new technology, I appreciated the first talk actually, uh, where the facility of the use, I mean, the, um, what we saw is how convenient it is to use this device and now it's could be um, helpful, especially when we are a single operator. So very curious to see the clinical um, evolution. Thank you. James, Tobias? I mean, I, I'm looking forward to using it in combination with Balloon Guide technology. We In the UK, we've got the Walrus um, and, uh, you know, it, it um, fits sometimes, but, there, you know, it's, it doesn't, it's not, I don't think it's licensed to be used with Walrus just because of the, um, the uh, the size. So, what do you have in the US that we don't have in the UK? <laughs> Which is lots, as you pointed out now. What what we look is, is yeah, it the EmboGuard. EmboGuard is a larger ID yeah. uh, that works. It's an 090. Uh, Walrus is 087. So there's some variance in the ODID situation of these catheters, which results in it. Uh, but I know the MIVI team is actively working on making sure that they can streamline their process. Uh, most other balloon guides are 087, um, so there is uh, the the boss, uh, um, no, not the boss, the one made by uh, Sophia, uh, I'm Bobby. forgetting the name right now, uh, yes, um, and so that is 087, so it's the same as Walrus, and then Cello and Flowgate are a little bit smaller, so they're less likely to work, which is what is probably available in the in Europe right now. I would say walrus works four out of five times. Yeah, I've used it with the walrus, but um, yeah, and yeah. Emma Guard sounds good. 
Sounds good. Okay. Tobias? Um, yeah, I think it's it's over now. So, uh, uh, okay, Thank you. we can over time. <laughs> uh, Thank well, you very I'm, much. For your yes. Yeah. I'm very curious uh, to use the combination of aspiration and the distal embolic protection. So I think this is a really good concept because I think that the the, the aspiration alone has a quite high um, probability of having distal embolizations. Yeah, that would be a good right. concept. I I personally feel that that is the Achilles heel of uh, uh, aspiration technology. I think it occurs with stent retrievers as well, as James pointed out, with the uh, cheese grating effect. But I, I have a suspicion, I have no great data, but I have a suspicion that that might be higher incidence uh, with aspiration alone. So, well, with that, thank you very much, everybody. We'll um, stop this webinar and you all have a good evening uh, or a good day, whatever you might be. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you too. Goodbye. Bye-bye.